residue or whatever you call it, you know, into the permeous paving. Right, so you're talking about a permeous paving um, maintenance issue right there, but what I'm talking about is the design element of putting in permeous paving essentially underneath or beside large trees versus young trees. Large mature trees versus um, young trees, all right? water flow to the trees. So potentially if you had those larger trees that have been there for a long time and have developed with a lot of water flowing to them and then you're spreading out the water, mm -hmm. you can change the, the like water behavior for that. So you're changing the local the localized hydrology and the water the access to water for the large trees, but more but as you're designing these trees if you just think of, and sorry, Chris, I'm going to pick on the civil engineers, oh, and the yeah. civil engineer, yes, Jean. Uh, I'm thinking that the uh, large trees will overshadow the younger trees, and they won't grow as well in addition to the fact what you just mentioned, the hydrology it will take more water from the mature tree versus the younger new transplants. Right, but the, even in the design stage of it, what happens is you have a civil engineer. He's been said, "Oh, I got a new contract to put in, uh, you know, with my design fees of two hundred thousand dollars. I have a, I have a new contract to put in eight hundred thousand dollars purpose paving around the edges of George Washington University. Let me just rip up the entire sidewalk." run down the entire street oh, yeah. and put in my pervious paving. So what are the effects going to be on those trees? It's going to disturb their roots. You're going to deeply into their critical roots, I'm generally right. speaking. So it will um, slow the back of down. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is such, typically speaking, in urban and tight suburban environments, the notion of BMPs and storm, uh, stormwater management systems and trees do not go well together. And part all, of what all I'm existing trees. Existing older trees, older tr existing right. trees, something, anything over like six, seven inches is essentially my guesstimate, though there's no, I'm just throwing that out there. Christina can. I'm sorry, what were the dimensions? Like six or seven inches, a six to seven inch tree would still be considered an immature tree for most shade tree types. Okay. Do you differ, differ with that assessment? Yeah, um, you want the trees to be like about 30 years old before they really maximize their benefits for shade and stormwater. Right. So trees, they're, I just talked about this before, trees are just now starting to be counted in in some of the more progressive municipalities as being effective stormwater management. Um, Treatment train, you know, part of a treatment train. And can you pull up what you did for Holly's house in terms of the eye trees analysis? Oh, yeah. Do you still have that? Yeah. So Christine's going to share this with us for this minute. But the so tree protection, we're going to go in depth in methods course today. But the important thing for you to know at this point is something called the CRZ, which is the critical root zone. And that essentially assumes that if this is the trunk of the tree, and that's the canopy of the tree, okay, that we are making the assumption, which is a huge assumption, that the roots of the tree are going to grow out in equal radius outside the tree. And they have documented trees can grow roots to miles beyond where the actual tree is located. Okay. In an unimpeded environment, trees can send out miles of roots in addition to the, I don't know, is this the bird's here? It's too much detail on here. Okay. Mycorrhizae, fungal matters have a symbiotic relationship with tree roots that are critically important to the health of both. And so that can also be disturbed. Chris and I have just been working on a site over in Washington DC. Chris, you didn't know this yet, but there's a, like a 24 inch BBH of a maple tree on the site that we've created a critical root zone around. So we put all of our stormwater man management facilities outside the critical root zone. Okay, and um, when we were put hand digging, but the drain inlet is over here, so we're hand digging a pipe to go over to that drain inlet for an under drain. When we were over here starting to do hand digging, we came up against some concrete 
walls that were below grade. So what we have found with a little bit of excavation, hand excavation, is that there was actually a concrete wall below grade very close to the tree. So we've had no evidence of any roots at all being on this side of the tree. So, you know, all the tree roots grew up to this wall. So we're in good stead because we don't have any problems. We know by being on site, the site verification, that we have no tree just critical root zone disturbance for this area, and that it appears that most of the bulk of the tree roots are growing into a grassy area on the other side of the fence. Okay? Most of what? We're growing on the other the root, the Most of the roots, the bulk of the root material is growing on the other side oh. of the fence. Okay? If you have a storm water that's going to be trapped on this side. And this is where my rain garden or bio, bio infiltration cell is, and we needed to pipe to the strain So we were First of all, we set everything outside the root root zone. But second of all, we knew we were going to have to pipe there, so we kind of created this angle that came in. But when they did the hand excavation, they were finding no roots. And I was out there every day looking for roots. So it saved my guys time and money to just be able to do a straight run here versus having to do something like that, okay? Because I was trying to be sensitive to the root zone. So what does that mean in terms of critical root zone? Well, this, this is that critical root zone, first of all, there is very depending on the species of trees, is that correct? It does. Okay. And um, there's a couple different books that will give you references for and more detail in methods class. But for the purposes of this class, again, so this is a, the um, trunk, or they like to, arborists like to call this the stem, and this is the tree canopy. And the critical root zone, <coughs> is most municipalities count it one inch of DBH equals one foot radius um, outside of the outside of the um, of the okay, well, I say that. So seven. seven, yeah. <laughs> is that right? Well that seven. isn't that kind of what you're approximating? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Just for example, if we had 12 inches or 24 inches of DBH here, what is DBH? The uh, diameter breast height. Height. It's four, four feet, four, four feet four inches from the gray ground is where you're supposed to measure the DBH of a tree, and it's the standard for measuring all trees. So if you have 24 inches of DBH, my critical root zone would be what? 24 feet. 24 feet this way. And the other way. And the other way. So, so what would my my DBH, I mean my critical root zone diameter? 48, 48 B. So that's my critical road zone. Okay? So that's one thing to consider. When you are an arborist or a designer of good intention, one might even say sustainable designer. And if you happen to be working in some jurisdictions, the rules change. Critical root zone is one inch DBH equals 1.5 feet radius CRZ. What do you have down in Virginia Beach, Christina? What do you have? That's what they're doing. They're, I think that's what they're using for the, uh, I think, I could be wrong, it's, that's what's in the Virginia erosion. They're using what? Which is very, like, not what arborists really want to use, but what they get away with. Okay, but 1.5 feet of critical wood zone. So now, if I'm looking at a 24 inch DBH tree, what am I looking at in terms of critical root zone? Somebody, what's the radius? 36. So what's the entire thing? 72, so that's a huge difference. That's, that is considered the critical root zone for a tree. <coughs> yeah, where did you say that was the standard? Um, so like we were doing, it depends on the jurisdiction. In Gaithersburg, it's 1.5 feet for, per one inch D, DBH, okay? In Silver Spring, it might be one foot per DBA. Uh, excuse me, in, I think in DC it's one foot. I can't recall. 
So a jurisdiction that, like in Tacoma Park, is 1.5. But if you're working on a project with a particular species of tree and you really want to know the resources where you could, you know, you could use a general right. number, I guess, but... Right. So, uh, no. As regulation, it's either one foot per, one foot critical wood zone radius per one inch of DBH, but some jurisdictions say 1.5. If you are um, doing it as a designer whenever you're doing any design. This is the first thing that I'm doing when I go into design. I'm going to talk about that more later on today. But I just do a rough sketch, um, like in Julie Holly's property, for example. You can see she has a ton of large trees. Probably once, we'll do this during the design studio time, but probably it was part of your in-class exercises that I provided for you last week. But when you go through here, you're going to see that Probably you can't realistically do hardly anything on this property in terms of a BNP unless you work closely with an arborist. Okay? Because I my specialty is putting in BMPs where there are large mature trees. And we consistently make the argument to local ar arborists that if done correctly, the trees will actually have greater benefit because they'll get better water. <coughs> um, and more water in a very flashy, strong environment, which is our local area. So, but we have to do it with a great amount of precision. And um, this last, there are two things that I'll say to, to kind of augment this conversation, which is one of the practices that you typically do um, is going to be, if you have to put in a, like a BMP inside of a root zone, so this is, might be a biofiltration cell, one rule of thumb, generally speaking, is that you can disturb up to 30% of the critical root zone for a healthy tree without killing it. Is that what you... Yeah, no, it's just finding an actual healthy tree in an urban area right. cracks me up. Right. Because there aren't any. So yeah, that's... It's harder to find. Right. So if and you, yeah. certain species are going to be more... Um, susceptible to tree to tree root disturbance than others, like a beech tree. A like beech you tree. You can't even like look at a beech tree without it freaking out. So be so these are the ones that they like no disturbance. Oh, cool. But like a sweet gum, you could you could probably get it. And um, okay. And I'm going to give you a reference for a really great reference that has it. <clears throat> so let's just rattle off a couple of them. So we said sweet gum, red maple. Give me some other ideas of trees that don't mind a lot of root disturbance. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I'll have to look that up. So, what are don't like disturbance? This is a little bit, there's a little bit of debate about that, but I believe white oaks don't like a lot oh, yeah, of, white oaks. don't like a lot of disturbance. Tulip tree. Right, tulip tree definitely, the tulip poplar. Cottonwood can take a lot of disturbance, right, Christina? See, as an engineer who doesn't know one of these trees from the other, I basically would go out there and and we'd look at a site and I would get with Lauren and, and, and she'd be able to say, well, we can, you know, we can't run the under drain. We have to, sort of like you talked about there, we have to run that under drain around this because we can't disturb these roots. So that's something we'll all consult with somebody. Did you say you got a good source for these? I have a phenomenal source and it's um, Matheny's book. Do you like Matheny's book? Yeah. Okay. And, um, I think it's called Tree Roots. Tree Roots. Tree Roots. Yeah, I'll, I'll write Bassett that up in a minute. And, uh, Cornell has a lot of great information. 
Yeah, Nina Bassett is like the goddess of all yeah. these trays. I, I brought this book in just because it's like eight dollars, so you guys, and it's simple, easy. You can get this through ISA. Yeah, yeah we'll we'll write that up on the board. Okay. So I'll write up a couple resources. Cool. It's just really cool. cheap and easy. Yeah. It, it's not teaching how to read a hybrid, but it explains the tree protection zones and critical roots and everything. Okay. okay. It uses the ANSI standards that arborists use. So that arborists typically work with. That. If for those of you that have native plants, or those of you that are familiar with some of these species, what is the difference between this list of trees and that list of trees? They grow in floodplain trees. So, and these are upland. So generally speaking, a rule of thumb, if you do the research on your trees and you're looking for trees to use or to, that you can disturb uh, root cells with, the trees that can tolerate a lot of disturbance are trees that are already in highly disturbed areas or that have, have um, adaptations. adaptations over years and years of high levels of water, high levels of drought, all right? Soils uh, scouring huge sediment dumps. So these are trees that can take a lot of abuse at the root level. When okay. you're talking about abuse, are you talking about water from water or just building in general, digging around it? Digging around it. So they have a lot of tolerance to disturbance within their critical root zone. So they are generally trees that you see in a lot of street trees because they oftentimes can tolerate higher levels of salt. They can, uh, and they can deal with people coming in, ripping out curbs and putting in curbs. Now, when you go to Georgetown, let's look at you're going to see a wide variety of the oaks, but the, our oak trees that do well for disturbance are going to generally be like the willow oaks or a swamp white oak or something like that. So trees, plants that, are do, that naturally do well in floodplain areas are ones that can tolerate greater root disturbance. So that means if you have a site that is filled with Red maples in one corner and beech trees in another, where are you going to put your stormwater BMP? Red maples. Red maples. You're not going to orient it towards where you have this beautiful beech growth, okay? Because I'm telling you, you look cross-eyed at a beech, you take up her skirt by limbing her up, and she's just going to croak right there on your, she'll die on your feet in about three years, okay? How come so many trees can't <gasps> Don't even talk about that. That's a lunchtime conversation. Yeah. Don't even go in there. Don't go over that. That's like, oh, blasphemy. Can I ask you, that's a tree. You know, in D.C. in particular, where, where they put um, oaks really close to, or lots of trees, really close to the curbs, and they grow up and over into the street. Um, and then you cut, they come and do curb work. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that they do curb work on the um, tolerant trees, they'll be okay for the most part, and the intolerant trees won't be? I always wonder about that, and they're running asphalt. Right, so when I, I'm actually going to be working with two other instructors for the methods course, because of this course I've taught for seven years, and I'm supposed to let it go this year, but unfortunately I'm getting back because I can't let it go. But um, we're going to have Barb Mills co-teach, and of course we'll go over all of the things. And she is the past president, recent ex president of the Consulting Arborist Society, the Grand Poobahs of all arborists. She's the Grand Poobah is of all. And so she's going to be in here teaching that for us. So we'll dive into that. For this purpose of this course, all you need to know is that you're either dealing with this restriction or that restriction. And when we have our studio time, I'm going to go over a quick exercise about how I do that um, when, as a designer, what I do and how I go about doing it, and then we'll just kind of roll with it. But I wanted to kind of show you, like, that's a, a huge concern for BMPs, and there's, like, this percentage of people that know how to do it well, like, almost none. Um, do you want to share your information about Holly's house? Yeah, um, I, because I, I didn't know, you know, what we were um, doing when yeah. 